morning. Are you coming in then? Good morning, and what a show we've got lined up for you this morning. I'll be joined in the house throughout the morning by step singer turned West End star Faye Tozer will be here. Yay! And I'm visiting a place where my career as a chef all began as my food adventures take me back to the stunning town of Saint Emilion in France. And Henley's hottest chefs, Ryan and Liam Sidson Trotman, will be dropping by with a fantastic recipe for Slariac, and grouse will be on the menu uh, when the very talented Sally Aby uh, takes over the kitchen a little bit later and I'll be trying to answer all your culinary questions and anything you want to know about how to make the perfect lasagna then don't miss this week's little mask class but we're kicking things off today the barbecue is lit because I've got some barbecue tuna and I'm going to serve that with a lovely oriental salad and a wasabi dressing now the wasabi is the key for this we're going to get to that in a second but first of all I mean just look at this piece of tuna glorious glorious piece of tuna I want a, a decent thick piece of tuna like that so we just get a glorious bit of thick tuna there. I'm not going to put any seasoning in this, no salt, no pepper. What I am going to do, though, is put some oil on because what I want to do this is cook this quite quickly. So the oil goes on, and I say cook it, it's almost just searing it, really. So straight onto the coals like that. We'll move this to one side. I'll quickly turn this over. And I say sear it because what you want to do is don't be frightened to put a bit more oil on this because we want it to flame. This is what we're looking for. So, and I want to get this charred sort of flavor. So you want the coals nice and hot for this. That's it. Get it really, really searing. So when you slice it, you almost got that definition to the, the bits that are cooked, the bits that aren't cooked. So nice and hot like that, which is looking pretty good to me. You can tell when it's, there you go. It's not far off. And there we go, we'll sear it off a bit more. So again, plenty of oil. That's what we want. That's like an oil slick, isn't it, really? But this is where your flavour will come from. A lot of people will panic at this point, but because the tuna, you don't want to overcook it. And the reason for this, I'm, I, I actually just want to sear it one side, sear it the other. You can do this in the pan. You don't have to do it in the barbecue. Either way, make sure the pan's really, really hot. And it wants to be in there for no more than about 30 seconds. So you get this lovely charred bit on it. So when you slice it, you get this real defined texture. But the great thing about barbecue, you get this amazing sort of charred flavour from it as well. So once we got to that stage, you can see it's nicely marked and nicely charred, which is looking pretty good. We're going to leave that to one side just to cool nicely. Meanwhile, over here, I've got my dressing. Now, the dressing is kind of like an oriental pesto, really. We've got some mint, I've got some coriander, I've got some palm sugar over here. You could just use normal caster sugar if you want. Uh, a little bit of tamarind but it's all about what I've got over here. This stuff, this beautiful wasabi. And before I start preparing this, I want to take you to one of these amazing producers. Now, I've been quite fortunate in this life to travel all over the place uh, and usually take a camera crew with me. Uh, but I visited this one place uh, in County Omar in Northern Ireland, uh, and we're about to meet them now. I spoke to them about sort of three, four years ago, something like that, uh, and we're about to introduce them to them. One of them has grown a lot bigger since the last time I saw him as well. Uh, we're about to speak to Sean and Zach Kitson, who are one of the very, very few wasabi producers outside of Japan. Now, there they are. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, hey. everyone. And uh, Zach, you've definitely grown taller since I last told you. You've been eating this stuff. You've grown. Yeah. You've shot up. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, tell me where it all began because it's quite an interesting story. It was actually your idea, wasn't it? Really, and you, you sort of, you told to, told your dad to build what you end up with now. Where, where did the idea come from? Well, the, the idea came up when I was only fourteen years old. I signed on a job. And um, I said to my dad, I, I really want to go with wasabi. And my dad says, OK, but he was this surprised why I want to go with wasabi. And I and I had the like about that the canoe. And Sean, tell us, tell us about it then, because what started off an, an idea by Zach, you then sort of took that idea, and I suppose that comes from your scientific background, because you're a scientist, by a job, how on earth how on earth do you begin to learn how to produce it? So what I decided to do, so Zach we originally wanted to grow rare garden plants. So 
and flowers and things. So we, we built a greenhouse for that, but it would have been too costly to grow these things if you wanted to grow. So he came to me about growing wasabi. So with my scientific background, I, I looked at you know several scientific papers on the on the growing wasabi, and we decided to to go for it. So we had this polytunnel built, and then we um, we then got some plants, some seedlings, and then we, we started to produce them, and then we're here today really. So we try and replicate the I mean wasabi in Japan has got to grow in the rivers or in the mountains in the soil. So we try to replicate, you know, having a good drain. It's important to have good drainage in the soil for the plants. You don't want any root rot. And we have our overwatering systems here, which we feed the plants with, um, with seaweed solution. And um, it's all organic. And so we're, that's where we're quite good at it, really. So. And what happens in the little buckets? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, over here. This is. This um, is this is um, the soil we grow in clay pebbles, so we don't grow them in soil, a right. nutrient solution. So this is known as hydroponics. So these are rhizomes here. You can see them. Yeah. So essentially, we're, dry, we're growing them hydroponically as well as in the, in the soil and gravel, in pots and also in the beds. And just to put it in perspective, you're one of, I, I mentioned at this top, just a handful of producers outside of Japan producing this. I mean... What is it, about a dozen people? There can't be many more of the uh, people like yourselves. Is okay, there producing 10, this? 10, 10 wasabi farms. Ten. That's all there is. Way back mm. ten outside Japan. Commercial growers. See, this is what I love about you guys. What started out like uh, as an amazing idea from you, Zach, has morphed into a re really great business as well. Best of luck with everything, and yeah. thank you, thank you for being a part of this. It was great to see you. Four years ago, and great, it's great to see you doing so well after the nightmare that we've all gone through. But keep it all up as well. Thank yeah, you very much. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. Look after yourselves, Bye. guys. To uh, see, look at this. This this is the this is the real McCoy. Now to prepare this, what I've just done is I've mixed together a little bit of mint. I've got some coriander. I've got a little bit of palm sugar. I've got a tiny bit of salt just to have a nice little bit of uh, uh, grit to this as well to help grind down this sort of mixture. Then you want to take this. And what you do with this is you just gradually peel it. Now, as I say, this is quite expensive. So when you're doing this, you need to be careful that you don't waste too much. Because I say quite expensive, this stuff goes from between 250 pound and 350 pound a kilo. A kilo! It is a serious amount of money, this sort of stuff. But you can use the entire lot. So that's why you want to be careful with the outer part but you can actually utilise the leaves as well. The leaves are fantastic for salads and bits and pieces and they have so much health benefits as well. It's an amazing sort of stuff. Then what you need, if you're getting some of this, you need to get yourself a ginger grater or a wasabi grater because what you do with this, this is like a, it's not a, a, a microplane, it's not like a normal grater. And what that is, is little fine little bits of metal on here. And as you roll this around here, you'll see it form into a paste. And this is the classic wasabi paste, which you mix it all together. Now, you can see this paste forming on here, look. Now, this bears no relation, no relation, to the green stuff that you find in supermarkets called wasabi paste. And, and, and people who watch this and know me for a long time know that I have an absolute hatred of a few things in life. Flip-flops. That's one of them. And the other one is horseradish. And that is what the green stuff is made out of. Horseradish to mix with mustard and other sort of flavorings that are not natural. This is the real McCoy. And what you end up with is this really strong paste. But what you need to do is almost leave it to oxidize and leave it to breathe. Because you've just, this thing's alive now, but it's really come alive now when you grate it. And this, you get this amazing flavor from this. So, this, mixed together with this mixture over here, is going to create an amazing little sauce. So I've got my nice little bit of green sort of pesto. I can then add a little bit of neutral oil, a little bit of grape oil, something like that, just a nice little bit of neutral oil in here. So you get this amazing colour, like that. Then I can add some of this glorious fresh wasabi. That's got a beautiful kick to it. 
it, it, I say, it's not horseradish. It's not the same. And you get this amazing flavour from it. It's totally, totally different. And then we can add some, a bit of lime zest over here. And this is going to create a little citrus note from it as well. So, touch of lime zest on there. And then this is purely optional. I've got in here some tamarind, but this really works together, I think, with everything else. But tamarind's, it's just, a, it's, again, when you buy it in its paste form, when you do it yourself, it's totally different again. But it's a little bit more complicated to get that pace as opposed to this is quite straightforward. But what you end up with is this nice little simple mixture. And then we're almost ready to plate up because we can get our tuna and then slice this through. So we can then take our knife. And you can see from this what I mean by the tuna. You end up with its, its seared but still beautiful in the center like that and you get that lovely color and then what I'm going to do is just going to pop that on our little plate over here and I'll bring it over so you can see it but pop it on our little plate like that another bit like that and then we'll bring that over here. And then what I think it just needs is simple flavours, really. You can then take your wasabi. That sits on there. And this has got a lovely punch from it as well. A little bit of that. You can then take a nice little bit of radish. I grow these in the bottom of the garden. These lovely breakfast radishes. But you get that sort of famous white oriental radish, daikon radish, which is much bigger than this, but these radishes fresh out of the garden, they're just delicious, full of water, full of flavour. Lovely. Another thing that's quite interesting, particularly around these, I call it this, this is sort of the Hampshire wasabi. This is um, where I live around here. We've got amazing spring water. Because of that, you have beautiful rivers, the River Test, the River Itchin, great for salmon fishing but it's also great for watercress and dotted around all where I live, you end up with amazing little watercress farms. And that, like the wasabi, needs this beautiful fresh water to grow from the chalk streams. But you've got a nice little bit of that. You can mix and match, you can put more mint and coriander on it. And then another thing that's quite nice with this is a little bit of mango. So we're just gonna taste a nice little bit of fruit with this, which is really quite nice, but you can take your fresh mango and we can just put a little bit of diced mango in this as well. So a few bits of that or slices. But we'll slice that up. Just adds a nice little bit of texture with it. But this in amongst with everything else. And then finally, we'll just put a little drizzle of this oil with it as well over the top. There you have it, fresh wasabi. Try it. Don't forget to get your grater while you're at it as well, because you can't do that on a cheese grater when you get this, you might have a bit of a problem. But let it oxidize like that and you end up with this amazing paste, this amazing flavor. But there you have, fresh tuna with fresh wasabi. Done, easy as that. <laughs> right, still to come, I've got dishes from chefs Ryan and Liam Simpson Trotman, and I'll be chatting to Singing in the Rain and Step Star Faye Tozer. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, it's your turn to put me on the spot as I try to solve some of your foodie problems. I'll see you in a minute. It's a good job, the foodie problems. I can't do problems at home. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a masterclass in lasagna a little bit later, and I'll be chatting to Faye Toza over a plate of sea bass very shortly. But first, it's that part of the show where you at home get to call into the show and ask me anything you want about food. Just about food, please. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, uh, reach out to our first caller now. Uh, we're first on the line today. We've got uh, Mark from Dorking. Are you there, Mark? Yes, I'm. Good morning, James. How are you? How are you doing? First of all, I can see you. You have got more stuff in your kitchen than I have. 
I do like a bit of cooking. I do like to play around a little bit. Absolutely. Um, yeah. there, there's there's a Ken Hom wok behind you as well. There's a bit of everything. It's like a, it's unbelievable <laughs> the kit that you've got in the back it of there. Is, yeah. <laughs> so so, so what? what are you, <laughs> so what are you having trouble? What are you having trouble with? What's your question for me? Scrambled eggs. Yep. I can do scrambled eggs. Been doing them for years. Right. Even use an ostrich egg in Africa. Really? But how right. do we take how do we take scrambled eggs up to that there that Michelin star level? How do okay. we get them to there? All right, right. We'll get we'll try and get it to there. We'll do it in different stages first <laughs> of all. So we're not going to use ostrich eggs. You can though use duck eggs. Duck eggs are amazing. Um, whether you use duck eggs or I've just got some normal conventional hen's eggs over here. Best quality eggs you can get, really. I've got some butter, I've got some cream, and I've actually got some fresh green chilli from my greenhouse, from the garden. It's amazing. And that's all really you need. Salt and pepper is the key. But the first thing you want to do is then crack the eggs into your bowl, first of all. So when I've learnt the best scrambled eggs, and I actually learnt this from the late, great Michel Roux Senior, who we sadly lost about two, two years ago. Now, he taught me how to do these scrambled eggs. And like you were in Africa with your ostrich egg, um, I was in uh, Dubai, and we were doing a, a thing about chefs around the world, and we were representing the UK. And there was me and Michelle there representing the UK, and he actually cooked this for me. So I'm gonna replicate this. Hopefully you'll be looking down thinking I'm doing it right, but what you wanna do is, first of all, is get the eggs, you wanna season them with black pepper and put plenty of seasoning in. So many times... That's a lot of pepper. You need to season it, all right? So it's not a lot of black pepper. It's the right amount of black pepper. Salt, this is you. Chef, you season it, all right? So you've got to season it with salt and pepper, first of all. Then what you do is you get a pan on the heat, but not too hot. The whole key to this is like cooking an omelette. The way you cook an omelette is, is not cook it so it's brown. So the eggs mustn't brown whatsoever. So you want to start off with the butter in the pan, you can crank this up a little bit and you can turn it down, but you want to get the butter foaming, but n when you put the eggs in, it mustn't go brown. The butter goes in and it's starting to foam up there, but again, not go brown. Now, at this point in time, pop the eggs in. And then you whisk. And then whatever you do, you don't stop whisking. Ah, right. You do not stop. That's where I go wrong. I'll leave it to settle for a no, little bit. No, you mustn't so, ah. stop. You're not creating an omelette. You're creating scrambled eggs, and for this, you keep going. Now, at certain points, which is now, you add a bit of cream to enrich it. <laughs> right, I like your bit of cream. Well, it's just a bit of cream. You said you wanted a Michelin <laughs> star at scrambled eggs, and now we take it off the heat. Now, a lot of people would just add a little knob of butter to this, and that's your scrambled eggs. But what you want to do is you take this, get your plate, get your toast, few bits of toast, get your spoon, and we take the scrambled egg. Now, you can see from the texture of this... Look at that, yeah. That is what we're looking for, all right? Now, I failed to ask you earlier what you did for a living. It wasn't a chef with all your pans in the back. You got an amazing job. You're a town crier yeah. out here as well. I am a town crier, yes, town crier for Dorking. I did 20 years in the uh, Royal Navy, so I've got a decent voice, and I learned to shout at people, so, yeah. Well, this is, this is how you do it. So in between your toast mastering and your town crying, you can easily create a meal. And whether you get chilli, leave the seeds in, but fresh green chilli... Leave them in. Leave them in. You've just... You've grown this amazing chilli plant and you're throwing half of it away. Leave it in. All right? This is the fresh chilli from my garden. You, you must... And most Fantastic. People, most people take the seeds out because they don't, they don't like it hot. It's too hot. Well, put less chilli on it. Oh, yeah. Um, what's, what's the point of having a chili if you're not having the heat? Yeah. There's no point, is there? Th there you have it. No. Hopefully fantastic. that's taking it that to a fantastic. different level. You can put fancy things, Absolutely. slow roasted tomatoes and all that kind of stuff on it, but the key to it is slow cooking, keep whisking, don't stop, touch of cream, salt and pepper. Happy with that? Fantastic. And if you ever get bored of that, I'd hate to move out, so you've got, like, a car boot sale you're going to need at the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> you can give me a couple of bits and pieces. Look yeah. at the amount of stuff. Anyway, take care. See you later. Thanks for yeah, watching. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. Well, thanks for that, Mark. Now, hopefully, we've got another question from Debbie in North Wales. Are you there, Debbie? Yes, I'm here. I yes. can see less stuff behind you this time. 
yes. Now, what would you like to ask? Um, my question is, um, this time of year, we usually get a large glut of courgettes. Yeah. And all I ever do with them is spiralise them into spaghetti or put them in a quiche. Um, this year, they're very small. They're well, not very big, but they've got the flowers on. So how... Hopefully, you can tell me what to do with them that's a bit better than spiralising. Debbie, well, mine's bigger than yours. This is, this well, is, yes. this is, this is, this is, this, these are from my garden, though, as well. The, these are, you can actually, these little ones with the flowers. Now, the flowers of these, like, you know, are amazing when you deep fry them. They're absolutely delicious. But what you have to do with the flowers, first of all, you have to take out the little pollen bit in the middle. You see that bit? Yeah. Take that bit out. Yes, yep. And then you can actually, the great thing about these, you can deep fry the entire lot. Now, you, there's, a, there's a great Italian dish, you know the fried courgettes, which I'm going to show you how to do now. That's one of my favourite things to do. You can either do it with the courgettes and the flowers, that I'm going to show you, or you can do it with the sliced courgettes. The easiest way to do that is to make a simple batter. So you start off with two tablespoons of double zero flour. Now, you've got to do it the proper way. Double zero flour is like the Italian flour. It's what you usually make pasta out of, that kind of stuff, where you get... You're trying to replicate that with your spiralizer, that kind of stuff. And you want your two eggs, and you mix the flour with the two eggs. And what you're creating is like a, quite a wet batter. So mix this together. Now, I mentioned Michel Roux Senior and the last dish with the scrambled eggs. This is actually Carluccio. So, oh, <laughs> the late great Carluccio. This this one. So two tablespoons, two eggs. Mix that together. You can put a little bit of seasoning off afterwards. Then you can either dip the whole thing in, like that. The courgettes. These are the ones with the flowers. Or you can dip the flowers themselves. So if you take the flowers, just the flowers themselves. You can use those and put them all in and then take them to a really, really hot fryer. So the fryer is about 180 degrees. So it's very, very hot. Now, you can see the reason why the batter needs to be quite liquid, because if it doesn't, it goes really quite soggy. So those are going to deep fry. Now, with the other load of the courgettes, depends on what you grow, because you've got the green ones as well, these are from my garden, so I've used the round ones, I've got the yellow ones as well. It's entirely up to you. The other way you can do these is prepare these and then slice them. But what you want to do is slice them quite thin. Now, a lot of people, what they do with these is salt them as well. But the salt draws out a little bit of the moisture out of it, which you can do as well. But then we slice these nice and thin, like that. So you end up with little matchsticks. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, like that. Now, also, a little birdie tells me that you're into your food, but not like our last caller, which is the enthusiastic cook. You actually do it for a living. Yes. So um, tell me what your business is, and because and, I'm just going to fry these courgettes in here. Tell me, tell me a little bit of your business. It's actually um, a shop. I bake, make cakes, celebration cakes, that sort of thing. The shop is just like a little corner shop um, in, in the village in Wales, in Blyna Festinyog. And you ended up, you ended up buying, a, buying a, a, where you are now, you ended up buying a bakery or buying a, some shop, because that, is that the oven behind you that yes, I can it, see? Yes, it used to be the old post office, um, which had a shop attached to it, the groceries. And this side of the house was a bakery and the baker's oven behind me. There were two very rusty oven doors behind me. Um, the, the actual oven had been demolished uh, when we moved in. So we built this wall and painted up the oven door and the sign above it. And it's now, um, let me show you. It's got my wine in there. I knew it would have your wine. <laughs> I knew it would have your wine in it. <laughs> Uh, my director's just <laughs> in my ear going, I bet it's got wine in it. It's got it. You need a refill, though. You've yes. been in lockdown for too long. It is, yes. Well, we've just come back off holiday in the caravan, and all we do in the caravan is drink wine, so we need to restock. <laughs> exactly. Where did you go in your caravan as I deep-fry these courgettes? Where it's, have you been? 
Yeah, this year we've been to many places. Um, we started off in Hoylake on the Wirral. We went to the National Memorial Arboretum in Stafford. Um, and last week we were just in Shrewsbury um, with friends in a field with wine. But look, these are your fried, fried courgettes. Look at these. How good are these? And so, so quick to make. Look. Then what you do, because you haven't got any salt and pepper on here, so then you put some salt on here, properly seasoned over the top, and then you can put your courgette flowers. You've got your fried courgettes. These in a really, really light batter. And then your fried courgette flowers. There you have it. And that, with a little wedge of lemon, is all you need. How's that for you? Fantastic. All right. right. That's what I'm doing this afternoon. That's <laughs> what you're going to do this afternoon. There you go. Don't forget to use the double zero flower. There you go. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Now, join me after the break. We've got two amazing chefs cooking at the hops. And don't forget, Faye Toza will be here. I'll see you in a minute. These, these are delicious. Even better with this. But proper delicious. Welcome back. Now, coming up, I'm taking a trip down memory lane on a food adventure to saint Emilion, that amazing part of France. And there's a mass class in Lasagna coming your way. But first, my guest today is a woman who set the charts alight with steps before winning Ray reviews in the West End. It's the one and only Faye Tozer. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to the house. Thank you. This Feeling is comfortable? gorgeous. Yeah, well, it's, it's lovely a room day outside. Out. It's all right. It's nice and warm anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Really, we've got a little bit of sunshine, yeah, which is quite good. Trying. You brought that with you. Yep. Um, so I thought I'd cook with you a, a nice little fish dish. First thing we do is got some beautiful sea bass over here. That is all you've got to do with the sea bass okay. to prepare <laughs> I can it. Manage that. That yeah. is it. All right. <laughs> now to cook a piece of fish, the most important bit is cook a half olive oil, half butter. Okay. Because a piece of fish like this is very, very thin. Yeah. And it needs to cook quite quickly. So a hot pan on the stove, like that. And you just put the fish straight in the pan. Now, sea bass will curl when you put it in the pan. So you just put it in the pan and hold it. Skin side first? Skin side down. Keep the skin side on the fish because it'll always protect the fish. Okay. Because the meat is the nice bit, obviously. The skin yeah. is nice when you get it crispy, though. Yeah. But you want to just make sure that it's held down because often when you put fish in a pan like this, it will curl up. Have you got the butter in there already? Just, no butter yet, but it's on its way. It's on okay, its way, okay. Faye. It's on its way. Hold your horses. So, so tell me about yourself then, because it's quite an interesting career you had, not only with Steps, but the bit before that. Because, you, you, were, you I mean, your stage was beckoning from you from a young kid, though, wasn't it? Yeah. That's what you wanted to do. Yeah, so um, I started... Mum sent uh, me and my sister to dance classes at six, and I did my first panto with Davy Jones from The Monkeys. Right. Um, at six years old. So I was always going to do something on stage. Um, but um, I was kind of looking towards doing musical theatre and through all the auditions and the dancing jobs and stuff that I had, I kind of ended up... Uh, Steps was the big thing that happened. So I've kind of gone all the way around and come back to musical theatre sort of after Steps has sort of quietened down. So, uh, yeah. and, and how did you get involved? Because when you first started as a young kid, age, like you say, six, and that's what you wanted to do, you, yeah. you first appeared on stage and that was you think, how do you then go about joining a band like that? Because... I mean, it's... Is it literally an audition? Or what, what? Yeah, simple as that. So it was um, an audition in the stage newspaper that said 18 to 22 year old girls and boys uh, looking to be uh, to front a pop song. So um, we all sent in our uh, bits and then they'd send a letter back to say if we were allowed to audition, if that were what they were looking for. Um, and then there were 600 people in the room, May the 7th, 1997. And then um, this version Time? of Steps was born. Well, 5 p.m. by the end of it. <laughs> you can remember it. Because yeah. I phoned my mum uh, from the payphone um, yeah. and just said, Mum, I think I'm in a pop, pop group. And she was just like, OK, darling, tell me tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like... Because, okay. I mean, a lot of your mates kind of think, really, really seriously? Because people do that and it... Some, it very, very rarely works. Yeah, and also, I mean, obviously, people who know Steps will know that it was 5, 6, 7, 8, which was like a line dancing song so I mean it was a novelty song and we didn't yeah. know if we'd have any longevity we didn't know what it was going to be for me it was just like it was a job so I was just really happy to be there and what <laughs> do you think I'm just I'm just going to 
this the fish you cook cook like this. The idea is once it gets up halfway up the side of the fish, yeah, which that is. Look, yeah. I haven't touched it. I haven't done anything with it. Once it gets halfway up. When did you add the butter? Like just now? About a minute ago. Okay. All right. Just when you started talking about the audition. <laughs> All right. And then we just turn that over. And they leave it. That looks amazing. And the, the other part of the fish will cook now. Yeah. And you just leave that to one side. So I haven't touched okay. anything, I've just left it, all right? You can manage that. I can manage that. Walk I in the park, you see? Easy. Easy. And then I'm gonna get on to do the sauce in a minute. But so when, what do you think the secret of it is? Because you you you've gone on to sell tens of millions of albums. Not just millions of albums. Yeah. Tens of millions. I think because we're unapologetically pop. And That's you know we're perfect for doing the hoovering too. So um, yeah, it works for us. Well, let's <laughs> let's have a quick listen. Let's have a quick listen. Congratulations. Not lost it, you see. And amazing Thank enough, this, this new album, tell us about the new one, because this is number... Oh, gosh, seven, is it? Yeah. Is it seven? Yeah. Six, might is be it? six, no, might be six. I think six. this is seven. my research, might be six. Six was what the future <laughs> was, <laughs> yeah. and this is part two, which I think is seven, actually. Right. Um, so, because of lockdown, because of COVID, um, we ended up doing two albums yeah. because we didn't do the tour. Um, we thought it was a great idea to add on the songs um, that didn't... Uh, happen or, or or it's just they're perfect for this chapter so um yeah we ended up as a uh, having a part two album and are you nervous with it all because when you're doing a tour and i mean it must have been nervous to do the first one but let alone after all these years and you split and then come back together and everything else that you've gone <laughs> through are you was, is that nervous because you i mean you appear in some amazing places or two and stuff like that yeah you're... i mean um the uh, steps tour our arena tour that we're doing that had to be moved for a year um is just, it's been a long time coming. We had a massive meeting the other day and we saw the stage set up and what's going to be moving and what's not and the different screens and... Do you get um, a say on that? Do you still yeah. get a say that you get a say? Really? Yeah, it's our baby. This is the one thing we do have our say on. Right. Um, it's always, touring has been something that's a massive, the creative process for all of us. We've all got loads of ideas. So we try and rein them in with our creative people. And, right. um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we want to try and uh, make all our Songs uh, different every time we tour, so people who come to see every tour have got something completely different to take away from the experience. Because the fans have travelled with you throughout through, throughout the the decades, really. I know we've been going. Well, it is. You've been going twenty twenty three twenty. It's going to be twenty five years next uh, next year. How does that feel for you? Because you're not, you know, you're not in your twenties anymore, dancing on stage. You have to then reorganise what you're going to be doing. Or I mean, I think some of us um, are quite happy to relax the choreography a little bit, but we say this every time, and then we get somebody in to sort of help us with our choreography and uh, create the show, and we end up like running up and down stairs in high heels still, and you know. But you know what? It all adds to it. You know, we're, we're all doing pretty well, all of us, to be honest. I think everyone's fairly fit and healthy, so um, yeah. Well, best of luck to it. So I'm go we're going to talk a little bit later also about other stuff you're doing as well, and we'll 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 talk about all that kind of stuff. But this is your little sauce for years. So amazing. all you do with the sauce is you just warm it up. Yeah. Now this is fantastic. With chicken, it's great with fish. Yeah. It, it's, it's great. I mean, this just on its own with, with veg from the garden is just delicious. It's a warm vinaigrette, but you keep all these lovely flavours, these tomatoes, everything else in there. And then the fish, all you do with the fish is you get the, the, the gubbins that's in the pan. Yeah. And you put that over the top. So this is all your butter and your olive oil and that kind of stuff. And there's enough residual heat from this fish you don't need anything else on there, like that. And then all you do is lift this off and put your fish... Uh, which piece do you want? This one? This yeah. one? This one? Yeah, this one? The, the biggest one. piece? Yeah, the chunky the one. The chunky oh, one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. And you just put that on there. Amazing. And that's all it is. So there you have my sea bass with a classic sauce for yesh. Easy as that.
Well, there you go. Bon appétit. Wow. Help yourself. Tell me what you think. Straight in. Yeah, straight in. Literally. And the, the, just to prove it, I'll show you this. Because a lot of people don't think the fish is cooked. If you lift this up, you I see? I was going to say, yeah. But look, the fish is cooked all the way through. See, right on cue, this fella comes in. I know. People, people think there's somebody pushing him in. <laughs> pushing him in from the back. Look, right on cue, he does it. He just comes wandering in, right on cue, like a show dog. Right. Me. What do you think of the oh dressing? It's so, it's so simple. It's so fresh and so light and... Good quality olive oil, mm. good quality lemons. That's all you need. And with vegetables as well, just on the barbecue, this is it's really, really delicious. Oh God, that's delicious. There you go. I'll be cooking a second uh, course for Faye a little bit later on in the show, mm. and I'm off to the southwest of France as my food adventures takes me to Saint-Emilion. But join me again after the break when award-winning chefs Ryan and Leon Simpson Trotman will be firing up the stoves. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be giving you a lesson in lasagna in this week's Little Masterclass, and there's plenty more to come from my guest, Faye Tozler, a bit later. But first, two chefs who have been winning rave reviews since they opened their restaurant nearly uh, 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago in Henley. It's the brilliant Ryan and Liam Simpson Trotman, everybody. How are you doing? You Great right? to have you back on the show, guys. Uh, you've Great been here be several, back. several times, usually outdoor cooking. Yeah. Now yeah, indoor yeah. cooking. Usually yeah. doing pork. Now now vegetarian. What's what's happened? Well, Liam's turned vegetarian on us. So yeah. He's gone all veggie on us and no uh, fish. No for, meat. For how long? It's only about five and a half, six months now. But you know, we went away in April and we went fishing. We caught no fish. We had nothing but meat on the bar. That's what you do when you go fishing. No, it was just meat all the way through, and I felt sick. I said to Ryan, no more, I'm done. And that was it. We did finish on Wagyu though. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> That's it. Your last supper yeah, was a Wagyu steak. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. So what's, but, what's on the menu then? Yeah, so today we're going to do this lovely salt baked slayerack. So a lot of people say to us, what do you do with slayerack? And we all say, salt bake is the best. It's, it's the, the best, best. For, for the slayerack. And it takes on so much flavour from that salt. It's just absolutely delicious. And we've had this on as a mm -hmm. starter on our tasting menus as well. It's absolutely beautiful. So but actually very simple to prepare. You've got one that you prepare here, but yeah. the ingredients of which are really simple. Yeah, so yeah. easy. It's yes. like basically 50% plain flour, 50% table salt, and just bind it together with water so you get a nice paste, not too soft, because obviously the last thing you want to do, when you wrap it around your vegetables, yeah. pop it in the oven, it'll start to melt off. Yeah. So this is basically just 50% of that, 50% of flour and salt, and then the water. You can use egg whites. A lot yeah. of chefs do use egg whites because it gives yeah. a bit of a firmer taste, yeah. but obviously vegetarian, vegan, this is actually... You're sort of looking at sweet pastries, so it's texture, aren't you, really? Yeah, but it's bloody... It's really hard. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> so, so he's done it for so you. So look, as you can see, you just yeah. smash into it, and yeah. it's just absolutely... It looks kind of strange, actually, when we see the KPs looking at it. Uh, like and that. also, I mean, we had the Daniel Clifford as well did the similar sort of thing. He was saying it's better to leave it, once it's in the salt, Yeah. better to cook it, cos that only takes, what, an hour, an hour and a half? An hour then, and a half. And then leave it overnight. Correct. Yeah, exactly, that. exactly. Yeah. So that's an hour and a half to two hours yeah. at 180. Yeah. Um, I don't know what gas mark that is, about gas mark five. Exactly, and leave for 24 hours in the salt bake. And what's going to happen then, it's going to continue to cook and penetrate the centre of that celeriac, so it's okay. seasoned. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a salt bake celeriac. We've got yeah. some apples, so we're going to do a lovely variety of apples. So we're going to do an apple puree, a caramelised yeah. apple puree. So we're going to use a Brayburn, obviously great bacon apple. We're going to use a sweet um, Brayburn, sorry, a Bramley, and also a tart Granny Smith. Okay. Well, what we're going to do with that, James, we've peeled them down, we've sweated them in a pan with a lid on it, and so we get this lovely caramelisation, and then okay. what we've done is blended that and emulsified it with a touch of oil. Nice and easy. Right. And it, it kind of works like a cheese course, because we've got the tumwith on there, and yeah. that caramelised apple is almost like your chutney. So then we put the fresh apple on, which has been compressed. You've got the truffle on there, right. the muscatel vinegar. It's ju it just all marries really well together. So yeah, along really with the celeriac, obviously classic celeriac and apple work well together. Yeah. We've got some beautiful pecan nuts. So all we've done with these pecans, we've literally just popped them in a baking tray, yeah. About five to six minutes, 180, taken out and then just seasoned with a bit of salt. Yeah. Uh, we use a thing called the flavour enhancer, which is great. It's actually seaweed extract powder, so it really gives it that nice flavour. You taste the nuttiness, the caramelisation. And in the pan here, all I've done, James, is just taken some of the celeria that we cooked yeah. yesterday, and all I'm going to do is colour it, pan fry it, a little bit of um, rapeseed oil in there, nice coloration, then finish it off with lovely foaming butter. What's, what's that bit that's just come so, out of the tree? So this is really interesting, actually. So this is caramelised solids from the butter. So you can make it by adding cream 
and buttered together, half cream to butter. So basically, you could... Where on earth did you think of this, this idea? We, we made creme brulee one day and spilled the milk and cream over onto the stove, and I just separated. We got butter, which we use for butter solids, and we got this brown stuff, and it tastes like unsweetened fudge. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. We also know it's used quite a lot at places like St John. Right. Uh, which is like one of our favourite restaurants. Just flavour upon flavour upon flavour upon flavour. And it's just a good way of, say, let's say we poach a bit of fish and we want to get that nut butter on there, but we want to keep it really delicate, we'll just finish with that on top and it gives the same... Now, last time you were on, you were thinking about getting a place, now you've got a second place. Tell me about the pub. You've ended up getting this pub. Yeah, I mean, so basically there's a little pub at the end of our street, where we are, Orwell's, in Binfield Heath. It's actually in Ship Lake, so lovely little pub on the main road. Uh, it was called the Plowden at the moment. Right. We're going to take it back to its original name called the Plow. And basically, we've saved it from demolition because it wasn't yeah. getting knocked down. So developers were all over it. Right. And we got together and we just said, right, OK, we want, we've wanted it for a, for a while now. Yeah. And it just makes sense. So for us, it was just a way to give something back to the community. But we were talking about it on the way down here. What we found when we were in COVID, we'd done that little shop thing and people were coming to the shop, weren't they? Yeah. And it's people we hadn't seen for years. When we first opened Orwell's, we'd done like a little Munchak burger and they loved it. And it was the community coming back and we just said, we've got to do something here. Yeah. And it was just great seeing the community. It was just put a big smile on the face. So, so who's going to work in, I'm assuming you guys then split you know Well, hopefully yeah. I'll get rid of him now so he can go down the road. <laughs> <laughs> if we could clone ourselves, we would. No, but you know, it's hard for everybody in hospitality, you know, the shortage of staff is everywhere. And it yeah. might continue into next year when we open. So we've just got to be really smart about it. We want to do a pub offering. It's going to be a seven day week operation, um, all day dining. Just need to be really smart, you know, create great menus where people will come back twice a week for it. Yeah. All wells is all wells. That's got its own little thing. It's got its market. We're well, talking about great menus. This was I've Keith seen, Floyd's seen, first I've seen ever you, restaurant. Uh, Google or <laughs> Instagram. A, a, a lovely viewer, yeah. a lovely viewer. I shan't name drop you, but you know, I want to say thank you as well. Hopefully, you got the letter from me as well. Lovely viewer sent me this menu, and it's a genuine Keith Floyd menu from his restaurant in Bristol. With the signature on it as well. I think I might have to um, touch that one. Isn't he one of your one. like big heroes? Because uh, you've done that show. Which well, is very... I'm, I'm the older generation compared with you, young whippersnappers. James, <laughs> you're like three years older than us. Come on. You're the younger generation. We moisturise. But, but <laughs> this gentleman, he was the godfather and still is the godfather of TV chefs. Yeah, yeah. I used to love the whole glass of wine while he was cooking. It was like one for the pot, two for me. Don't know what you're, ta what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and he's had to go with it as well. What have you just done in there? You've so just that, grated that so stuff. So that is the brown butter right solid. So okay. literally all we're doing now is enriching it. So you see there's a lot of butter in it. It's been foaming. It's really penetrated it. All we're going to do now is grate that on and get it off. And this is basically ready to go. Do you want to try okay. some of this on its own? I'll tell you just what, as a solid. Go on then. Just, I'll get, just, get a little spoon. We've got a little clean just, spoon just there. Stick yeah, it yeah. on there. Is that all right? There you go, look. This is, so just this is this is this is butter, yeah. Yeah, it's just caramelised butter. Uh, this is the solids from the butter. So we take the curds and whey, separate it, and etc. Well, that's all right, isn't it? It's all right, isn't it? It's yeah. naughty, isn't it? That goes yeah. in a lot of stuff. Great on fish. It's like it's like fudge. Yeah, yeah. But you can add the savoury because there's no there's no sweetness to it. It's really really good. Really good idea. So yeah, so we've got that on there. We've got the solids on there. We use the same grater. It's absolutely fine. And we're just going to give it some truffle as well. Just we a all... little bit of truffle. No, we all love truffle. <laughs> <laughs> I love it how you guys work together. See so the way you, did you just cook everything. and you just give him it and go. That, you just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that's how our life is. is. As... <laughs> it's, it's the best. It is, I prep. I cook. I give it. He to just Ryan, stands there giving it all this. <laughs> look, just look what I've been doing. You know, we, we've been listening a lot to uh, Radio Two over the lockdown and stuff like that. And there was a, um, on the Steve Wright show, there was a little snip about relationships. Yeah. People don't like cleaning. But if you've got a partner who loves it, they say, allow the partner to do the stuff they love the most, then you spend more time together doing the stuff you enjoy. Cool, so I've put the tumble on, which I absolutely love well, as well. You're the only person that's allowed to play. Yeah. Right, okay. No, actually, you I play. know my place. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Liam's plating is absolutely fantastic. And what I'm gonna do there, you, right. can, you can put the dots no, on, no, no. actually. Ryan's got this thing, right, man. where when he puts food on a plate, it looks bonky. And I said, that's your Midland heritage, Ryan. Everyone just goes in the middle, it's like, <laughs> bang! And I have to, have to like, disassemble and reassemble oh, you it. you can't say like, that. I so you can, put, you can put the pecans on, there you go. Oh, thank you very much, chef. I'm going to give you something to do there. There you go. So this is so simple. Then... So this is the caramelised apple, which is absolutely great. If you want to try that, James, have a little... So that's got on, that's that the one. one that you've just... You need to just yeah. cut the apples down with... Yeah. Yeah, so basically, prepare these three types of apples. Yeah. Peel them, core them, cut them small, whack them in a pan, 
sweat them down completely, and when they're sweated, then take the lid off, and then they allow it to juice even further, and then you get the caramelization happening, because obviously the natural sugars in the apple do come out. Yeah. But so I absolutely is... love this. This is for me. This this bit here is almost like the, you know, like the salami of vegetables. Where's this cheese gone that you had? Where's that gone? So that's all been grated on, on top. Oh, of the tumus on the top. Yeah, oh, tumus right. all on the top. And then if we just drapes a little bit, so that. So what that does, that just adds a lovely little bit of freshness to the dish, because yeah. it is quite rich. And that's why it's, it's like almost like a little pastrami sort of thing going on. And again, just to cut through it, because it's quite salty. With yeah. some compressed Granny Smith apples, these are just being compressed in a little bit of lemon juice. Add a bit of texture because a bit of crunch to it and a little bit of sourness too for that richness of the cheese and the richness of the salt salaria. And I've got to try and convince you this, this is just as good as eating a pork shop. A nice little bit of meat. <laughs> Do you know what? Salaria's amazing. And yeah. I know this is going to taste delicious. You just know it is because it's... I mean, salt baked Slarex, amazing. So we're going to get a bit arty farty now. We're going to put a few little marigold flowers on there as well. OK. But what I love about eating it. things like this, you feel... That's the way the world's going a little bit. They want to eat lighter, and everybody eats a bit lighter. And I think that as a starter. Right, can I just rewind sandwich. you to the last time? What was the last dish you you cooked? Was the mangalista pork? Ma was it? Yeah, well, mangalista pork, 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 where you use pork fat, pork this, pork that. We so, still do that. Right. No, don't get me wrong. We, we still do that. It. And now, but because good... of COVID, <laughs> now you've turned into a salaria. <laughs> that's that's a good start. Let's right, okay. let's just say that's a good start. Good starter. But we still, yeah, I mean, man mangalitsa. Come on. Yeah, you, can't, you can't beat a bit of mangalitsa. What's that you're putting on there? A little bit of cold pressed rapeseed oil. And that is it. Okay. That's what you call teamwork. <laughs> well, I'm armed and ready. Which one of you is passing the plate? Liam. Yeah, I'll do the passing, you know, you I do, do all the hard work around here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honest opinion. Well, I, I mean, just... <laughs> I mean, all your food looks beautiful and it always tastes beautiful as well, but... I mean, the celeric is... It's, whether you do that or beetroot, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that salt yeah. bacon. It's definitely celeric. We also uh, love doing kohlrabi like that. Oh, yeah. Kohlrabi's really good, salt baked. Mm. A dish is all about textures, and you manage to get all those textures with the pecan, the apple. It all works really, really well. And like you said, with that, that caramelised apple, it, it, it proves that vegetarian food doesn't have to be mundane. And no. You know what I mean? Yeah. A little bit of imagination, but it could be just that salt-baked salad. Just delicious, isn't it? Yeah. And that little bit of acidity as well. I'm very important that I learned in France when working over at Toile Grove, the acidity is key. Acidity is key. But having said that, that apple puree is the one that brings it all together, mm. isn't it, really? Yeah, that nice little bit of sweetness to it. Ryan and Liam, everybody. <laughs> right, Chef Sally Abu will be trying to top that dish very shortly, and I'll be laying on lunch uh, for step star Faye a little bit later. But don't go anywhere, because after the break, I'm in the heart of France's wine country on a food adventure as it takes me to Centimillion. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be showing you how to create the ultimate lasagna in this week's Little Mars class. And I'll be treating my guest, Faye Toza, to spatchcock chicken very shortly. But before that, it's time to take a look at some of the dishes you lot have been inspired to cook at home. So, first up, we've got a video from Mrs West, who seems very happy with the way her beer butt chicken turned out. Look at this. Ooh yeah. Looking good. Hello to my little friend. Look at that. Uh, next, uh, Darren Savage uh, has been treating himself to my recipe for clotted cream rice pudding. Now, this needs another 10 minutes, I think, in the oven, 10, 15 minutes. But I can honestly say, clotted cream, when you add it to the recipe, takes it to a whole different level. And it's properly cooked as well. It's baked also. But finally, top marks goes to James England for this stunning plate of cod. Now, look at this. Look at that. There's the money shot. Look at that. Going around the split sauce. Looks great there as well. How good does that look? It even goes in for the killer shot. Lovely. Right, do keep sending your pictures and videos coming in. We love seeing those and um, what you've been inspired to cook at home. 
OK, it's time to take a look back at another one of my favourite ever food adventures. Now, this week, I'm heading back to saint Emilion, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I'm visiting the vineyards of a British winemaker who fell in love with this region, just like I did when I went there as a child. Enjoy this one. With wine, so much is down to location, and that's never truer than here in France. The French are completely obsessive about the concept of place or terroir. And it's always confusing sometimes to people who grow, grow up um, uh, un understanding wine by looking at the label and seeing Cabernet Sauvignon. There's something rather reassuring about that. So you learn, you, many people in the world learn their wine drinking through grape variety. And when you come to a French label, there's nothing on it. The same with, with cheese, it's the same as wine. The whole thing about France is a, an obsession with place. So when you buy your bottle of French Plonk, you're not looking for Chardonnays or Pinot Noirs, you're looking for Chablis, Burgundies, or even a lovely saint Emilion. It's not the grape so much as where it's grown that counts here. And it's that sense of place that's important to me too. So I'll be cooking my next dish here in Jonathan's vineyard, if that's okay with him. James is more than welcome to come and cook, and if he does, I'll bring the wine. Cheers. Now, Jonathan, that's an offer I can't refuse. Once I've finished my afternoon snack, of course. Macaron, macaroon, whatever you call it. Scone, scone, who cares? Stick it in your mouth and enjoy it. Mmm. They're delicious. Now, I could cook something with these, and I'd like to do a chocolate mousse. However, currently, at this present time, it's about 35 degrees, so while you're watching this, I will go deeper and deeper shades of red, OK? Now, I thought I'd do a lovely fish dish, but what I'm going to do is just take a little bit of ling. Now, this is a wonderful little white fish. You can use hake if you can get it, you can use haddock, but so often when it's fresh, it's quite floppy, quite delicate. So by salting it a little bit, just for about 10 minutes, it firms up the flesh nicely. And I'm going to serve this with a classic beurre blanc. Now, there's variants of this all over France. This is a classic sauce that's thickened with butter. And our producer said, we'd love to do this sauce, it's classic, fits in with everything you've done, really, but ideally what you need for beurre blanc is very, very cold butter, which we haven't got. So I'm going to give it my best shot and try this. But first of all, what we do is make a reduction, and for that, we use some shallots into the pan. And then we add aromats, like white peppercorns, these ones. I don't often use white peppercorns, really. White pepper, I tend to see it, I put it in mashed potato, really, and that's about it. And a reduction like this. So, a few white peppercorns, a little bit of fresh thyme, a few sprigs, a touch of bay leaf. This was fresh till 15 minutes ago, now it's dried. That goes in. Now, you need a reduction for this. It's the aromats, the things that are in the pan, the shallots, the peppercorns, the thyme, the bay leaf. And you get the reduction from this white wine vinegar. Now, sometimes you can use white wine, sometimes you can use white wine vinegar. Today, I'm going to use both. But you just get white wine vinegar, a just good glug. Now, what this will do is actually cook the shallots as well while it's reducing. And then we take equal quantities, white wine vinegar, together with some amazing white wine from this chateau where I'm cooking now. Just a little bit. Because most of it's going in the glass. Because I'm getting hot. That's H-O-T. For those people who don't understand Yorkshire. Or at. That's good, that. Next, we reduce this down. Now, while that's reducing down, and we're waiting for our cold butter to get cold, over here I've got a steamer, and I'm going to steam my veg for this. Now, I'm going to go right back. Now, chefs watching this will, will laugh their heads off, to be honest, because this is something that you kind of learn at college. One of the techniques that I kind of, I say I mastered over here, I haven't done this for about sort of 10 years. This is the art of turned veg. Now, it's kind of a forgotten art, this sort of stuff. If you go back to ye olde cookbooks, the kind of cookbooks that you've got, Rob, those ones, they'll have these in there, you'll see pictures of it. But this is what cooking was like. It was basically preparing the veg like this. Eight weeks I was stood there doing this. 
It's not finished yet. Carrot. Similar one with the carrot. Now all the while this is happening, and I'm changing colour, the pan is reducing down to almost nothing. This is the reduction. What you want is the essence of the wine and the vinegar, the shallots, the peppercorns, everything else. What you don't want is liquid. Because when you add the butter, that liquid will split our sauce if we're not careful. There you go. We've got enough there, I think. But what I'm going to do is steam our veg. So we take all of our veg, whack it into a steamer, like that, and get that cooking nicely. All the while, this is reducing down nicely. Meanwhile, we can prepare our piece of paper for our fish. A piece of like that. We'll fold this over. Now, I'm doing this because this is exactly how we used to do it way back then. Like that. And then taking our piece of fish. It's a good idea, that salt trick. It starts to firm it up, really. It's kind of perfect for this. Cut it through, like that. Probably do a nice piece like this onto our greaseproof paper. A little bit of seasoning, black pepper. We take our nice carrots and our courgettes, which are cooking nicely. Now, look at this colour in here. Rob, get in here. Look, 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 look. Look at that. Look at that. Now, stay on it, Rob, stay on it. Don't leave me. And we take the fish in there. Put the lid on and cook it away nicely. Next, while that's happening, we've got a few chives. So diced chives. The thing is with the beurre blanc, you want to make sure you've got everything ready. So you've got it all set. So now the key to this is cold butter. It's cold. Right, now what I'm going to do is make a classic Berbalong, that sauce. Ideally in a cold kitchen, but out here it should be just as good. So you take your whisk, all oh, the liquor's almost gone. You see, get in there, look, Rob. Almost disappeared, look. Not a lot of liquid left in there. But then what we do is we take our butter. Now, if you're into sort of health food, you might kind of want to turn away at this point because this dish is not for you. This is butter. <laughs> Just a little bit. Right? Don't go ruin this at home and make it with margarine. It's butter. It's called beurre blanc for a reason. White butter. We mix this all together and you keep whisking it and whisk it and whisk it and whisk it. And the idea is, as the butter melts, it thickens up to create a sauce. I used to make this to order. And if it wasn't right, it was generally the contents of the pan that was thrown at me from one end of the kitchen to the other. Now, you thought there was enough butter in here with the packet. Just a little bit more. It's nearly there. Starts to thicken even more. Look. Now, at the same time, now we can take our fish out. Because this is ready. Lift this out. Leave that to one side. You've got your nice little bit of turn veg. And then we take another little bit of butter. So there's a theme throughout all this. A little bit of butter, like that. You just roll that around in the bottom of the pan. Because we use this to glaze our carrots and our courgettes, so they go in. Once they're glazed, they can go back into our saucepan, like that. Now, in our pan, we put our spinach. We're just going to wilt this down nicely. And then, finally, pass this through a sieve. So what you end up with is the essence of the butter, the aromats and everything else but without the shallots. And you can see that the butter has actually thickened the sauce. And I blame this probably for my love affair with butter, to be honest. I spent so much time doing it, 
And then finally, into our sauce, we grab some fresh chives. They're going to go in. Now, I never got to do this in the hotel. This is the special bit. This, this is the bit that requires 20 years of experience, putting it on the plate. Now, I'm doing this exactly the same way as it was served back then. This was two Michelin stars back then. It's a little homage to Saint Emilio. Look at that. Quite happy with that. Next, take our fish, pop it in the center. And then finally, your classic Berbalon. And after that, I need a glass of wine. It's good, that. So there you have it, my delicious steamed ling with turn veg and a beautiful Berblanc. Perfect with a little chilled white wine. And in, I don't know why I'm looking at my watch, in six days, I'm going back there. Simple as that. Uh, still to come, I've got a mouth-watering recipe from Chef Sally Abe, and I'll be serving up a spatchcock chicken with red pepper butter for Faye from Steps. But after the break, I'll be teaching you everything you want to know about lasagna in this week's Little Masterclass. It's very simple, but complicated. In fact, no, it's simple. Anyway, I'll see you in a minute. Welcome back. Now, Chef Sally Aby is back in the house with a dish of grouse very shortly, and I've got a recipe for spatchcock chicken that will make a perfect lunch for my guest, Faye Toza. But first, it's time for this week's little masterclass, and this week's masterclass is for Victoria Gab, who says that whenever she makes lasagna, her sauce becomes too watery. So the sauce is going to be the first bit, the white sauce that I'm going to make first of all, just to prove that point that you can get it right. So the white sauce usually contains uh, full fat milk, some butter, some flour, but the most important thing I think with a white sauce are these three ingredients here. It's bay leaf, onion, and some clove. And what you need to do is you need to create like a little onion clouté. It's, uh, it's a thing that I used to do when I was at college, really, you come across this. This is the classic way of making a bechamel. So if you ask any chef to make a bechamel sauce, they would always make it with an onion clouté, never with just the three ingredients over here, the butter, the flour and the milk. What you do with the onion is you take the onion and you stud it with a clove, or a couple of cloves like that, not too much because they're quite strong. That is an onion clouté, so it's a studded onion with bay leaf and clove. And you pop that into the pan with the milk. There we go. And a touch of the cream. You can enrich it with a little bit of cream as well. Why not? Why? Well, rude not to. A little bit of cream. And then what we want to do is warm up that sauce. Now, at the same time, we can turn our atten attention to the lasagna. So the lasagna we've got over here, we've got some beef mince, I've got some tomato puree, onion, garlic, We've got some thyme and we've got some stock over here. They're the fundamental. I've got my lasagna sheets over here and I've got some wine, I've got some tomatoes over there. But the first thing I want to do is get our onions and our garlic on. So with the onions really, you can chop these up. So leave the root on, slice it through that way and then chop it through. Now, usually, you don't cry when you're chopping onions with a really sharp knife. That's the key to it. Make sure your knife is really, really sharp. So slice it through. Cut it through on the angle, and you chop through nicely like that. You want to make sure it's quite finely diced, not too chunky, is what you want. Lose the little tops. And then in the pan now, we can then add a little bit of butter or oil. It's entirely up to you. I'm going to get my wine ready. And we can use a little bit of olive oil. Why not? Now, a lot of people refer to lasagna as the actual the, the meat part or the pasta sheets. Actually, the sunny refers to the pot that it used to be cooked in, in Italy. So you want to cook this without colour. Then, at this moment in time, we pop in our beef mince. Good quality beef mince is what you want. I know it sounds daft, but don't get mince that's too fatty. If you get the fatty one, sometimes it can affect your sauce, and that can create your sauce to split. So make sure you get really good quality Lean beef mince. Tomato puree goes in now. And you want to cook out these ingredients. So get this pan going. Like that. So this then starts to cook. Now we can think about this 
just quickly wash my hands. So while we've got our beef cooking away nicely, this milk and cream mixture is now warmed up. You can see it's warm. We just leave that to cool down to one side. Next, we can turn our attention to our thyme. Now, because this takes about half an hour to cook, you can use dry thyme for this. I've got some fresh thyme. It's entirely up to you. You can use a little bit of rosemary. Again, if you want, it's mix and match the different flavours, whatever you want. But with the beef, I think fresh thyme's really nice. So then we've got a little bit of wine. And of course, what we need to do first of all is check, obviously, to make sure it's a decent wine to be able to use, you know. Yeah, that's all right. Little bit of wine in here. Just a touch of vino. Use a nice little bit of Rioja. And then I've got some tomatoes over here, tin tomatoes. They go in. Now what we do is we bring all this to the boil and we gently, gently cook this. And I say gently, just gently simmer it for about half an hour. Once that comes to the boil and we simmer it, this is what we end up with. You can see this nice mixture over here as the tomatoes start to stew down. That's exactly what we want, all right? Now, while we're going to rewarm that up, because that's cool, you can actually let it cool cold and rewarm it up as well if you want. Meanwhile, I'll get a pan on here to make our... That's really nice, that wine. Um, we make our nice little bechamel, or white sauce. Now, the key to this is using 25 grams of butter. So you want sort of a slice of butter like this. So the butter goes in. Now, the important bit is, is the flour. Too many times people add too much flour, I think, with white sauces, particularly when they're making uh, cheese sauce, that kind of stuff. So anything that's got cheese in it, it's going to thicken up anyway. If you add too much flour, you end up putting more and more liquid in. It detracts from the flavour and everything else. What you want to do is just add just a little bit of butter to start with. So we're just going to turn down that meat. And then this now, I'm using this pan so you can see inside. Now, look, you're going to get people freaking out of this using a non-stick pan and a whisk. But life's too short, to be honest with you, to start moaning about stuff like this. It's a proper, proper pan as well, this one. Look, we're just going to take a little bit of this, then the flour. And it's important to use plain flour, not self-raisins, for obvious reasons. You want to add a touch of flour. And I'll show you the roux that you're looking for. It's actually quite liquid, look. So many times people make a roux and it's really thick at this point. If it's thick at this point, it's, it's like wallpaper paste when you're finished. It's horrible stuff. So you keep this pan on the heat. And using a whisk, then you add the infused milk and cream mixture. Keep the pan going. Now, you see the reason why I'm using this pan? Because you can see inside it and see what's happening. Look. If you keep mixing it, the lumps will then go away. If you just keep mixing it, mixing it, mixing it, and gradually, gradually, you can do it in about four or five stages, we add the milk. But everybody panics at this point. If you add too much liquid to this, it'll become lumpy. But keep the pan on the heat. And by keeping it on the heat, you can see the texture of what it's going to be. There you go. And you've got your nice little bit of leftover bits of milk. And we just bring that together. Now, hopefully, Victoria, that is what you're looking for. That's what you want. That sort of rich, lovely, not too thick, not too thin. You've got your lovely sauce, which that is. Then we can take this off. We can season this. Salt, black pepper, sauce done, all right? Don't need to have to do anything else with that. That's your simple sauce. Next, those are your two ingredients. You've got your sauce, you've got your meat. Your meat is nicely seasoned as well. We can turn, over, turn our attention to the pot that we're going to cook it in. Le Chani sheets, you get in two different types. You get the fresh one, which is the pliable one. You get the dried one. It's entirely up to you which one you use. The only difference is, I think, with the fresh ones, if your dish doesn't fit it exact, it's easier with the fresh ones to cut with a pair of scissors and you can sort of make up a sort of a jigsaw puzzle from the remaining little gaps. But that's what you want to do with this. So you start off with a little bit of the minced beef in the bottom, like that. Sits in the base. And then we get your lasagna sheets. You're going to put probably about three in there. That'll be fine. Then take another bit. 
Now you almost want this in sort of three layers, I suppose. That's what we're looking for. So like that. Then another chunk. There you go. Like I said, it's entirely up to you whether you use the fresh one or the dried one. But build it up in layers. And you see you've got plenty of liquid in there, plenty of juice. It's not too dry. So it's not too wet, but not too dry. There you go. And then you get your lasagna sheets again, like that. Three of those. And then all you do is you turn your ascension now to your white sauce. So this is your lovely white sauce. We can then pour this over the top. Like that. And you can see the texture that you get from it. While it's still hot, that's going to be the texture what it comes out as, really. That's important not to let this go cold. This goes over into the edges. Like that. Let's switch everything off. And then it's entirely up to you which cheeses you use. So often it's Parmesan cheese and mozzarella. But you can use this type of mozzarella if you want. This is usually the lighter colour, the, the different colour one is the cow's milk mozzarella. You can see the colour of that one as opposed to that one, which is the sort of buffalo mozzarella. But it's entirely up to you which one you use. You can put a bit of both on if you want. So what we're going to do is pop this. Now, the great thing about this is you can make this day, the day before, two days before, pop this in the fridge at this point, set the oven about 200 degrees. It's about 400 Fahrenheit. Gas mark about seven, something like that. And pop it in the oven for about half an hour. And this needs to cook in here. So I'll just pop this one in, because this is for the crew lunch. Look. And you've got your hot bubbling lasagna that goes with it. We'll take this off the dish. Look at that. Now, I don't know about you, but it's, it's a bit like the fish pie bit. The bit that you want to fight about is the bit that's stuck, stuck around the edge, those bits. And then hot, but it's like molten lava, this, when it comes straight out. It's boiling hot. And then, of course, you can then... We can either cut this, in fact, we'll cut it. Probably easier. There we go. And it is proper hot. But you see this the sign, it goes like misaka, it puffs up a bit. But look at that. Homemade lasagna. Easy as that, with a classic white sauce. And trust me, that white sauce, when you taste it with the addition of the onion, the bay leaf and the clove, takes it to a different level. So there we have it, a classic lasagna with a nice bottle of Rioja. Done. Yeah. There you go, Victoria. Hopefully that helps. Now, if there's anything you'd like to learn about in a little masterclass, then do get in touch. We'll see if we can help out right here on the show. It's a good dish, that. Time now for a quick break. We'll join me again in a couple of minutes where Chef Sally Abbe will be treating me to a dish of grouse that sounds right up my street. I'll see you in a bit. Welcome back. Now, I'll be cooking one more final dish for my guest, Faye Toza, very shortly. But first, a chef who cut her teeth in some of the best restaurants in the land. And I mean the best restaurants in the land. Your CV is amazing, to be honest with you. Not just the restaurants, but now in some of the finest hotels as well. It's the brilliant Sally Abe. Good to have you back. We didn't put you off the first time you came on. You're coming back again. You're going to be cooking this amazing dish. It looks spectacular. The ingredients look spectacular. What are you going to be making? Um, so I'm going to do some roast grouse with yeah. some uh, red cabbage that's been lightly fermented. And then we've got some pickled blackberries, figs, chicory and some bull's blood. OK, it looks very autumny there, doesn't it, really? But tell us about the grouse, first of all. So you want to get that on quite quickly. Yes, yeah, so um, you want a really hot pan. Um, there's no fat on grouse at all, really, so you yeah. don't want to give it um, an awful lot of time in the pan because you'll start to get real grey rings on there. Yeah. So you literally just want to crisp up the skin and then go straight in the oven and it's a more gentle heat. I find if you do it all the way in the pan, um, you don't get quite a nice result as you do from there. Uh... Now, I said you worked in some of the best restaurants in the land. One in particular, I've got to say, you worked there for, is it five years with the Ledbury? Yes, yeah, yeah. With yeah. Brett? Yeah. And, and Brett is obviously a huge supporter of game anyway, and particularly grab 
This is this is kind of where you learn how to cook this sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we cooked so so much game at the Ledbury, and um, it just kind of became ingrained in me. And then when I took over at the Harwood, it just sort of carried that on, really. Yeah. So and you mentioned the the, the Harwood because that's where you were last time, and now you've now you moved. You've you moved somewhere very very different. Yeah, I have a so complete change of scenery. So I'm now um, looking after all of the food and beverage at the Conrad St James Hotel in Westminster. Yeah. Uh, and we've just opened the Pem, which is like my signature restaurant there. So that just opened the three pen. weeks ago. Pem. Pem. Yeah. <laughs> and and you're you're, but you 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 were a Michelin star chef in a hut in a restaurant. You got everything you've probably ever succeeded, and then you go and leave that and do something completely different. Yeah, I like a challenge. <laughs> I, I think it's just great. It's great, great that you're doing that kind of stuff. But so it must be a quite a new challenge because a hotel, running a hotel, is very different to running a restaurant, isn't it? Really? Yeah, it's. Um, you're in charge of everything. Yes, it's 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 very different, um, but it's a really good challenge, you know, and it's using your brain in different ways. And I'm not necessarily, you know, on the stove. 16 hours a day, like I have yeah. been previously, but it's great just getting to learn all the different parts of the business. Um, you have to be a manager as well as a chef. Don't exactly, you? yeah, yeah. And obviously, we've got the restaurant, but there's a pub as well, and then we're doing afternoon tea and lots of all different things. So it's nice being able to turn your hand to a few different things. Okay. Now, you pop that grace in a, in, in a hot oven, that doesn't yes. run very long in the oven. No, probably only. I've taken the legs off because I find the legs can be quite tough, so I'll use them to make sauce. So yeah. once the legs are off, it's probably only going to be five or six minutes. So. Okay. Um, and then this red cabbage here, we've just fermented this for a couple of weeks, so just in a little bit of salt and sugar. It just gives it a really nice acidity. I okay. think so often red cabbage people spend like four hours cooking it down and down and you just lose the flavour of it and it yeah. just ends up tasting like port and balsamic vinegar or something. So this is a really nice way to do it. So we're just going to roast that, pop that in the oven as well. And then we're going to make a little pickle. So I've just got some raspberry vinegar, water and sugar. So we'll just uh, mix all that together and then I'm just going to pour that over the blackberries. OK. Um, just to give it a little bit of... Where do you get your ideas from then? Because, I mean, looking at your CV, I mean, do you, do you go back to look forward or...? Well, um, I suppose you, you do in a way, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a combination of things, really. I mean, my cooking is, is just driven mostly by the seasons, but it's, it's always flavour-focused. That's the most important thing for me, rather than presentation or anything like that. I just want flavours to marry and, you know, come together in harmony, essentially. Yeah. But uh, the, London, the London restaurant scene moves at a, a million miles an hour. The pace moves at a million miles an hour. It does, yeah. <laughs> and you get the feeling with sort of COVID and what's happened is... It's stabilised, which is probably what it needed to do, don't you think? I think it needed not a reset, but a, a stop, appreciate what you've got and what you're doing, and then off again. Yeah, I think it's basically taught me to work smarter rather yeah. than harder. You know, it's not, it's not a badge of honour to say, oh, you know, I've done 19 or 20 hours today. Actually, it's just stupid and you're exhausted. Well, so. you can be busy fools, <laughs> can't you? Yeah, 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 exactly. So I think it's, it's about managing your time, um, you know, and I think your staff work better for you if you're rested and you know what it yeah. is that you need to achieve without getting upset or anything in the kitchen. It's just, um, yeah. yeah, not not necessary, really. So I've just got the livers here that have been chopped up, so I'm going to monte them into the sauce. So just, just in a blender? Raw? Yeah. yeah, yeah, just raw in a blender. So in, instead of, you know, Traditionally, you'd monte butter in. For Where example. does this come from? Where's this? <laughs> well, I just think it's quite a light dish. Obviously, you've got the grouse, but then everything else is quite light and fresh and acidic. So I think you need that guts to sort of balance it all out. I've never had way. this. That, that, I mean, would you always do that with, with with other things or just just with the grouse liver? Um, no, yeah. I mean, I you know chicken liver, uh, any birds really. I think it's just a really nice way to to finish the sauce and. Um, right. Obviously. So you're only putting a little bit in, not too yeah, much? Yeah, yeah, not too much, yeah. You'll end up with glue all the way in. But I mentioned some of the places where you worked. Claridge's, the Savoy was one of your first places yeah. to work. It was, yeah. Do you, do you, you've got what's gone back round to hotels again? Yeah, I mean, I moved to London to work at the Savoy and I didn't really know very much about London or anything. I just wanted to work at the Savoy. I think I must have seen it on TV or something. And, um, yeah, that's what brought me here, and then I just ended up staying. But um, I, I, I suppose I never really would have considered working for a hotel prior to COVID, but the opportunity came up and it just seemed uh, yeah. too good to, to turn down, really. So that is ready. So they're going to come out. 
Now yeah. we've got some at the back that have been resting as yes, well. Yes, they're been... ready to go, yeah. So I'm just going to... They've got a few little chicory leaves here. I'm just going to give them a little swirl around in this butter so they so get all that lovely it's equally important flavor. when you take the game out, whatever it is, whether it's grouse, pheasant, partridge, to allow it to rest. This is the yeah. key to it, isn't it really? big time, yeah. Yeah, it needs to rest for at least half the time that you've cooked it for, essentially. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just give them so a little... So what have you got in there? Let's just... Mix in there. So we've got some bull's blood, which is from your garden, which is very nice. <laughs> Uh, and then well, just a bit of chicory. That's half of what I've got left, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the chicory just I wondered, bring I thought a that seems of... a bit familiar there. <laughs> I've got a few figs down there. They don't look like theirs yet. But, you know, we're trying. <laughs> Cabbage. That there. So then the grass, we've got these just ones that we had earlier. This looks amazing. Though. So that's probably had about eight minutes resting. Just going to... And like you say, okay. cooking it on the crown, it, it almost takes the hassle away for people. I think when people are faced with grouse and stuff like that, with the legs, yeah. what do you do with it? Yeah, I mean, the legs are tricky. I mean, you can sort of comfy them, you know, cook them nice and slowly. But um, personally, I think the it makes a really, really great sauce if you just whack them in there. They have lots of fibres and stuff in, so um, it's a bit, a bit tricky to eat. I always just cut the real middle out as well, because that bit can be a bit bitter. So just give them a It's little. interesting you do that. I, I, I think there was probably only one other chef I know of that does that, that takes out that middle bit. Oh, really? It's important, isn't it? it yeah, does, it's, it's really important. Quite... It can be so, so bitter, it's just not, yeah. it's not nice to eat at all. And I think that's the thing, you know, people are so afraid of... Some people are so afraid of game and, and eating grouse. You need to be really careful when you serve it so as to manage people's expectations and to make them understand that it can actually be really, really, really delicious, so... Yeah. Okay, so we've just got the cabbage here. It's, do you know what's interesting? I've been doing this for many, many years, 20, 28, 29 years. It's interesting when you, when you sit here, and usually I'm stood there working, you learn to appreciate chefs. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but the way they work and the way that they move, it's really, it, it, but do you know, but no, but the way it's economy of movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. And the way I'm watching you work, there's a reason behind everything. Yeah. It sounds daft. Whereas if you watch somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, they become busy idiots and running around <laughs> all over the place. But yeah. do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a way you work, and it's just it's amazing to watch. It's just thanks. Anyway. Okay, and then we're just gonna get blackberries. So these have just been warmed through, just. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'd normally maybe like sort of do it cold and do it the day before. But... I'm quite actually glad nobody's spotted. You haven't spotted my mulberry trees. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, yeah, you're not having them because these were the girls lovely with them. But... <laughs> yeah, and then we're just going to finish it with this sauce. I'm just going to put a little bit of whiskey in the sauce because you know grouse, whiskey. That's pretty good. Match made in heaven. <laughs> And interestingly enough, you don't need to flame that as well, do you? Really? Just a little bit I think at the end. I, I really do love a little bit of raw alcohol at the end of a sauce, whether it's that or fino sherry I finish a lot of yeah. things with. It just gives it that little bit of oomph. So I'm just going to... You have made that look so, so easy. <laughs> and it isn't. And it's really interesting, that little bit of liver in there with the sauce is really... Yeah, it's a, it's a nice way to finish, so... And where are some of the figs? Figs are going on. Nearly forgot them, didn't I? <laughs> Just put a couple on there. Quite big. Lovely. That's probably enough. There we go. So give us the name of this. So it's roast grouse with fermented red cabbage, blackberries and figs. Cooked by a genius young chef. Sally, everybody. <laughs>
Incredible. Absolutely incredible. That is delicious. Thanks. A brilliant bit of cooking. Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. All right, we've got time for one more dish now. Uh, so join me again in just a couple of minutes where I'll be making a slap-up lunch for my guest, Faye from Steps. Don't miss that one. See you in a bit. This is amazing. Amazing. Good. Welcome back. Now, for the last part of the show, I'm back in the kitchen with my brilliant guest from Steps and now singing in the rain. It's fabulous Faye Tosa. <laughs> now, I cooked for you earlier. You've been hanging around with the dog and stuff like that. And, and we've got a little gift for you to take home as Ooh. well. Uh, but first thing, I'm going to cook you a nice little bit of chicken. Because I, I know chicken's your go-to thing at home, isn't it? Ready to cook? Yeah, kind of, but not roast chicken. Right. I will dice it to an inch of its life and then just Why? because I have the fear. Um, I have been known to give people food poisoning. <laughs> It's not really a laughing matter, that face. <laughs> this is why I avoid it. So, um, right. yeah, yeah. OK, all right. Yeah. Well, we're going to show you how to roast a chicken Thank nice you. and quickly. <laughs> we, first of all, we're going to make a simple little butter. All OK. Right? So we've got butter and red peppers. These red peppers you can buy already out of the jar. You don't even have to prepare them. They come like that. Amazing. Really <laughs> simple. And then what you do, I'm assuming you've got a blender. Yeah. <sighs> That was good. Otherwise, you'd be taking one of these back with you, and I need this for tomorrow. I should have said no, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we got we take our red peppers. Now these are wood roasted. They produce this amazing flavour. But see this liquid in there. Yeah. You don't want that. All right. That's just a little bit of juice from the red peppers. You blend this all up. Now at the same time of this, we can add some butter. So this is a flavoured butter to go with the chicken. All right. So you can take this idea and do whatever you want with it after that. You can just use butter. You can use butter and herbs, butter and a little bit of pesto if you wanted to. Love pesto. But the whole idea of it is you take this mixture and you blend it all together and this will create a nice little butter with it as well. Okay. Now, I mentioned at the top of this the West End. Yeah. Because you've been busy. I've been busy. Very, very busy. busy. Yeah. Um, basically, because COVID stopped all uh, theatrical entertainment for a while, yeah. um, as soon as the phone <laughs> rang, I said yes to everything. <laughs> but my first phone call was from uh, Singing in the Rain, um, which is... Please tell me, it was, the, was, it, was it the main guy that, was, that, that phoned you up, or...? The main guy, the, the producers real... and all yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I uh, played uh, Lena Lamont before in 2013. I did the UK tour of it. Yeah. I did six months of it and I absolutely loved it. So when I got the phone call saying, would you revisit the role, I, I literally had a bit of an emotional moment and I ran downstairs to my son who was on the sofa and I was just like, oh my God, they've just happened meeting in the rain. And um, it's just the most joyful show. It's so beautiful, and the character that I play is so ridiculous but um, iconic. It's just, it was just... Because you've got a great cast involved in this one. Yeah. From Strictly and yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean... And also um, the amazing Adam Cooper, who was... Um, I was fangirling. He's a very famous uh, ballet dancer. Um, who was Quite actually, a famous, yeah. Um, so he's, uh, if you know the film Billy Elliot, he was the adult ballet dancer at the end, um, and he's just incredible. I mean, he's, I mean, like, the, the, the Fred Astaire of now, wouldn't you say? I mean, uh, incredible. Yeah, I mean, just to see him performing Singing in the Rain uh, at the end of the first act every day is just... You just don't get bored of it. It's just glorious. Right, I'm going to show you how to do this chicken, spatchcock chicken. You've just so literally you... snipped the bottom out. OK. Well, I have literally snipped it. Yeah. Well, actually, that's the, that's the bottom bit, but that's the, that's the neck bit. OK. So you start... So you, you... Half an inch all the way from top to bottom. This is its neck. Bit in to the bottom bit. And you trim that all off. All right? Yeah. So lose that out of the way. OK. And then you turn it over, press it down. That is now spatchcock chicken. OK. That's all you have to do. Now, the great thing about that is that it speeds up the cooking process of cooking a chicken okay. and stops you poisoning people. <laughs> Which because I need. Not quite stops you poisoning people, but it means that when you cook it, it should all cook evenly, at even temperature. OK. So then what we can do is we can increase the flavour of this. Now, this is where you could add tonnes of different flavours. If you want to do stuffing in it... Yeah. So once you get the idea of it, your finger goes just underneath, you take your mixture, your red pepper butter and everything else, and you take this and you squeeze I it. I'm intrigued. I've never seen anything like squeeze it. it. It looks like a chicken that's gone to a gym now. Look. <laughs> so, so, 
I mean, you can't be shy with it, can you? No, and you you, you basically t take this and you stuff it underneath the skin. OK. And what you're doing with this is you're getting this amazing flavoured butter, this red pepper butter... Yeah. ..underneath, all right? You can do it all underneath and everything else. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be too perfect with it cos it's all going to melt anyway when it's in it. So don't worry about this being absolutely perfect. Just stick it all in like that. See, it looks quite funky. There you go. <laughs> then what you do is then we're going to put that on sort of a, a, a tray of sort of veg. And the veg side of it is nice and easy. You just take all the different veg. So you've got your, your onions, your, your leeks, your carrots, your peppers, all those kind of stuff. And yeah. we chop it all up and then roast the whole thing on a little trivet. So the whole thing just gets roasted all together. So when you've done the theatre, is it, is it, I'm mean, presuming in your job now, now you've got, well, you're talking about the steps tour and everything else. Yeah. I'm sure the planning in the diary, cos it must have gone from being like a chef. We've gone in Covid land where there's nothing in the diary and then all of a sudden... But big Everything. chunks of your diary have been filled up because yeah. it's got to be planned way in advance, all the stuff that you're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably booked up for the next two years now, which is amazing. Um, cross fingers all going to plan. Yeah. But um, I'm going to be revolving doing... Um, so I've just finished Sing the Rain in London, um, going on to the Steps Arena tour November, December, and then uh, on to Darlington uh, for Panto straight after uh, the Arena tour. Right. And then back on to... Singing in the Rain UK tour for a few weeks, um, and then into um, Step Summer touring gigs, uh, which will I'm be assuming you do the festivals and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we're, we're getting more and more gigs come in um, sort of daily to fill up the diary, um, and uh, that's going to be going towards our 25th anniversary for Step, so that's very exciting. It's uh, all coming together, look. Yeah. So there, there, your roast chicken. All right. I mean, my it would never look like that if I did it, but it looks amazing. Of course it would. It's easy. <laughs> look, then you take some fresh herbs. What is that? This is oregano. Okay. It's only because I've got it growing in the garden. Okay. You can put, you can put sage on it. You can put thyme on it. Rosemary. It's entirely up to you. But I grow just, rosemary, so I could put rosemary. There you go. You can put rosemary on it. Olive oil. Again, your favourite. A decent amount of olive oil over the top. That's a lot. A little bit I'm, more olive oil. I'm so used to doing my um, one cal spray. Bit, and season it, all right? <laughs> you don't use that spray can of oil, do you? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I know, I know. You're going to change my life today. It's, yeah. You can't do I can't do a cooking show and stand there with a spray can of oil, can I? <laughs> can't do. I'll get enough letters as it is. I'll probably get even more with that. Look, <laughs> then what you do is you take this yeah. and you set the oven 200 degrees and roast it in the oven for about... About 45 minutes, oh. all right? And then this is what you... So there's no need to take it out. Whether the roast chicken, you would take it out and baste it all the time and that yeah. kind of stuff. There's no need with this. You just roast it oh, as my it goodness. is. Look, I'll take this one. So salt and pepper over the top. Just chuck the whole lot in. You've got all the veg That's in. It. That's it. That's all you've got to do. It's so crispy and it smells yeah. amazing. It smells amazing. It tastes amazing. But it's not quite finished yet. Because okay. then what we're going to do is you're going to take this and while I'm plating it up, we can see you in action on stage. Because this, this is, this is pretty cool. It's amazing your career because you've been, made a success out of everything you've done. Because uh, I mean, I was reading about you. What did you? Were you a musician as well? When you were younger as well. I played alto sax. Saxophone yeah, player. That's yeah. got to be cool. You've got to start that again. <laughs> I've still got it. I was trying to encourage my Benjamin to play it. Actually, you've so got to play yeah. that. That's the coolest instrument to play. But everything <laughs> you've been doing, 
you've done to amazing success. Critical acclaim for all the theatre stuff. Congratulations on everything, and best of luck with the tour as well. Just for whatever you do, just don't get into your cooking show. Um, <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Stay away from MasterChef. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Look, and we take the juices from the chicken wow. over the top. You've almost got a meal all in one. But then what we do is what I love with this, and this is this is purely optional. We get full fat creme fraiche. Okay. <gasps> mm. Oh. Oh. And you dollop full fat creme fraiche okay, on this. Okay, I'm into that. And it gets into this sauce and it creates this really amazing sort of sauce with it as well. I'm literally Then with it. textures, you want, uh, rather than almonds, pistachio nuts. Yeah. And you've got pistachio nuts when you get them, like these. Put these on the top. But these... Are amazing, just lightly chopped through, but it adds a nice little bit of texture. But you can change it, you can put pomegranate with this if you wanted to, yeah. But pistachio nuts over the top, so there you have it. And I've done enough for two people. If there's four of you, you can put two chickens in. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, start the new series as it goes on. But there you have it roast chicken, stuff with a red pepper butter with vegetables all cooked in one pan in about 40 minutes in the oven without food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> There we go, Faye. Just for you. All of it for me. Yeah, all of that is for you. <laughs> Start wanting to work your way through it. I'm, <laughs> it just smells amazing. I'm going to go. Well, can I say, it. best of luck with everything you're doing. It's been a pleasure having you at the house. Ah, uh, thank so, you. Thank I you hope I've much. learned something. I'm going to actually, I'm going to try these and I will send you a photo of them to prove that I've done it. Either that or a, a, don't send me a death certificate. <laughs> That's not a good idea. But... <laughs> Hospital bill. Yeah, don't send me that. <laughs> Oh, my God. 40 yeah. minutes in the oven, that's all it takes. Oh, my God, that's delicious. It's so tasty. Mm. Isn't it? It's nice and easy Can with I the veg is all cooked. <laughs> yeah, and tasty with the cr creme fresh as well and everything else. Yeah. It's lovely. Well, that's it. That's all we've got time for today. A massive thank you to my guests, Sean and Zach Kidson, Ryan and Leon Sinson Trotman, Sally Abe, and of course, the brilliant Faye Tozer, everybody. <laughs> See you back here at the same time next Saturday morning. We'll be joined by more top chefs, another brilliant guest. Until then, take care, stay safe, and thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. Cheers. Cheers. Lovely. Cheers.